Third part of Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darvinia. Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green. Part 6. Florence Digby, in her short and sheltered life, had possibly never known any very great or deep emotion, but she touched the bottom of extreme terror at that moment, as with her ears still thrilling with Violet's piercing cry, she turned to look at Mr. Van Brooklyn, and beheld the instantaneous wreck it had made of this seemingly strong man. Not till he came to lie in his coffin would he show a more ghastly countenance. And trembling herself almost to the point of falling, she caught him by the arm and sought to read in his face what had happened. Something disastrous, she was sure, something which he had feared and was partially prepared for, yet which in happening had crushed him. Was it a pitfall into which the poor little lady had fallen? If so but he is speaking mumbling low words to himself some of them she can hear he is reproaching himself repeating over and over that he should never have taken such a chance that he should have remembered her youth the weakness of a young girl's nerve he had been mad and now and now with the repetition of this word his murmuring ceased all his energies were now absorbed in listening at the low door separating him from what he was agonizing to know a door impossible to enter impossible to enlarge a barrier to all help an opening whereby sound might pass but nothing else save her own small body now lying where is she hurt faltered florence stooping herself to listen can you hear anything anything for an instant he did not answer every faculty was absorbed in the one sense then slowly and in gasps he began to mutter i think i hear something her step no 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 step all is as quiet as death not a sound not a breath she has fainted oh god oh god why this calamity on top of all he had sprung to his feet at the utterance of this invocation, but next moment was down on his knees again, listening, listening. Never was silence more profound. They were hearkening for murmurs from a tomb. Florence began to sense the full horror of it all, and was swaying helplessly when Mr. Van Brooklyn impulsively lifted his hand in an admonitory hush and through the daze of her faculties a small, far sound began to make itself heard, growing louder as she waited, then becoming faint again, then altogether ceasing, only to renew itself once more, till it resolved into an approaching step, faltering in its course, but coming ever nearer and nearer. "'She's safe! She's not hurt!' sprang from Florence's lips in inexpressible relief and expecting Mr. Van Brooklyn to show an equal joy, she turned toward him with the cheerful cry. Now, if she has been so fortunate as to find that missing page, we shall all be repaid for our fright. A movement on his part, a shifting of position which brought him finally to his feet, but he gave no other proof of having heard her, nor did his countenance mirror her relief. It is as if he dreaded, instead of hailed her return was Florence's inward comment, as she watched him involuntarily recoil at each fresh token of Violet's advance. Yet, because this seemed so very unnatural, she persisted in her efforts to lighten the situation, and when he made no attempt to encourage Violet in her approach, she herself stooped and called out a cheerful welcome which must have rung sweetly in the poor little detective's ears. A sorry sight was Violet, when, helped by Florence, she finally crawled into view through the narrow opening and stood once again on the cellar floor. 
pale, trembling, and soiled with the dust of years, she presented a helpless figure enough, till the joy in Florence's face recalled some of her spirit, and glancing down at her hand, in which a sheet of paper was visible, she asked for Mr. Spielhagen. "'I've got the formula,' she said. "'If you will bring him, I will hand it over to him here.' Not a word of her adventure, nor so much as one glance at Mr. Van Brooklyn, standing far back in the shadows. Nor was she more communicative when, the formula restored, and everything made right with Mr. Spielhagen, they all came together again in the library for a final word. "'I was frightened by the silence and the darkness, and so cried out,' she explained, in answer to their questions. "'Any one would have done so who found himself alone in so musty a place,' she added, with an attempt at lightsomeness, which deepened the pallor on Mr. Van Brooklyn's cheek, already sufficiently noticeable to have been remarked upon by more than one. "'No ghosts?' laughed Mr. Cornell, too happy in the return of his hopes to be fully sensible of the feelings of those about him. "'No whispers from impalpable lips or touches from spectre hands? Nothing to explain the mystery of that room so long shut up that even Mr. Van Brooklyn declares himself ignorant of its secret?' "'Nothing,' returned Violet, showing her dimples in full force now. "'If Miss Strange had any such experiences, "'if she has anything to tell worthy of so marked a curiosity, "'she will tell it now,' came from the gentleman just alluded to, "'in tones so stern and strange that all show of frivolity ceased on the instant. "'Have you anything to tell, Miss Strange?' "'Greatly startled, she regarded him with widening eyes for a moment, "'then, with a move towards the door, remarked with a general look about her, "'Mr. Van Brooklyn knows his own house, "'and doubtless can relate its histories if he will. "'I am a busy little body who, having finished my work, "'am now ready to return home, "'there to wait for the next problem which an indulgent fate may offer me.' "'She was near the threshold.' She was about to take her leave, when suddenly she felt two hands fall on her shoulder, and turning, met the eyes of Mr. Van Brooklyn burning into her own. "'You saw,' dropped in an almost inaudible whisper from his lips. The shiver which shook her answered him better than any word. With an exclamation of despair he withdrew his hands, and facing the others, now standing together, "'recovered some of his self-possession. "'I must ask for another hour of your company. "'I can no longer keep my sorrow to myself. "'A dividing line has just been drawn across my life, "'and I must have the sympathy of someone who knows my past, "'or I shall go mad in my self-imposed solitude. "'Come back, Miss Strange. "'You, of all others, have the prior right to hear. "'Part Seven. "'I shall have to begin,' said he, when they were all seated and ready to listen, "'by giving you some idea not so much of the family tradition "'as of the effect of this tradition upon all who bore the name of Van Brooklyn. "'This is not the only house, even in America, "'which contains a room shut away from intrusion. "'In England there are many, "'but there is this difference between most of them and ours.' No bars or locks forcibly held shut the door we were forbidden to open. The command was enough. That, and the superstitious fear which such a command, attended by a long and unquestioning obedience, was likely to engender. I know no more than you do why some early ancestor laid his ban upon this room, but from my earliest years I was given to understand that there was one latch in the house which was never to be lifted, that any fault would be forgiven sooner than that, that the honor of the whole family stood in the way of disobedience, and that I was to preserve that honor to my dying day. You will say that all this is fantastic, and wonder that sane people in these modern times should subject themselves to such a ridiculous restriction, especially when no good reason was alleged, 
and the very source of the tradition from which it sprung forgotten. You are right, but if you look long into human nature, you will see that the bonds which hold the firmest are not material ones, that an idea will make a man and mould a character, that it lies at the source of all heroisms, and is to be courted or feared, as the case may be. For me it possessed a power proportionate to my loneliness. I don't think there was ever a more lonely child. My father and mother were so unhappy in each other's companionship that one or other of them was almost always away. But I saw little of either even when they were at home. The constraint in their attitude toward each other affected their conduct toward me. I have asked myself more than once if either of them had any real affection for me. To my father I spoke of her, to her of him, and never pleasurably. This I am forced to say, or you cannot understand my story. Would to God I could tell another tale! Would to God I had such memories as other men have, of a father's clasp, a mother's kiss! But no! My grief, already profound, might have become abysmal. Perhaps it is best as it is. Only, I might have been a different child, and made for myself a different fate. Who knows? As it was, I was thrown almost entirely upon my own resources for any amusement. This led me to a discovery I made one day. In a far part of the cellar, behind some heavy casks, I found a little door. It was so low, so exactly fitted to my small body, that I had the greatest desire to enter it. But I could not get around the casks. At last an expedient occurred to me. We had an old servant who came nearer loving me than anyone else. One day, when I chanced to be alone in the cellar, I took out my ball and began throwing it about. Finally it landed behind the casks, and I ran with a beseeching cry to Michael to move them. It was a task requiring no little strength and address, but he managed, after a few Herculean efforts, to shift them aside, and I saw with delight my way opened to that mysterious little door. But I did not approach it then. Some instinct deterred me. But when the opportunity came for me to venture there alone, I did so, in the most adventurous spirit, and began my operations by sliding behind the casks and testing the handle of the little door. It turned, and after a pull or two, the door yielded. With my heart in my mouth, I stooped and peered in. I could see nothing, a black hole and nothing more. This caused me a moment's hesitation. I was afraid of the dark, had always been. But to curiosity and the spirit of adventure triumphed. Saying to myself that I was Robinson Crusoe exploring the cave, I crawled in, only to find that I had gained nothing. It was as dark inside as it had looked to be from without. There was no fun in this, so I crawled back, and when I tried the experiment again, it was with a bit of candle in my hand and a surreptitious match or two. What I saw, when with a very trembling little hand I had lighted one of the matches, would have been disappointing to most boys, but not to me. The litter and old boards I saw in odd corners about me were full of possibilities, while in the dimness beyond I seemed to perceive a sort of staircase which might lead... I do not think I made any attempt to answer that question even in my own mind, but when, after some hesitation and a sense of great daring, I finally crept up those steps, I remember very well my sensation at finding myself in front of a narrow closed door. It suggested too vividly the one in Grandfather's little room, the door in the wainscot which we were never to open. I had my first real trembling fit here, and at once, fascinated and repelled by this obstruction, I stumbled and lost my candle, which, going out in the fall, left me in total darkness and a very frightened state of mind. For my imagination, which had been greatly stirred by my own vague thoughts of the forbidden room, immediately began to people the space about me 
with ghoulish figures. How should I escape them? How ever reach my own little room again, undetected and in safety? But these terrors, deep as they were, were nothing to the real fright which seized me, when, the darkness finally braved, and the way found back into the bright wide open halls of the house, I became conscious of having dropped something besides the candle. My matchbox was gone. Not my matchbox, but my grandfather's, which I had found lying on his table, and carried off on this adventure, in all the confidence of irresponsible youth. To make use of it for a little while, trusting to his not missing it in the confusion I had noticed about the house that morning, was one thing. To lose it was another. It was no common box, made of gold and cherished for some special reason well known to himself. I had often heard him say that some day I would appreciate its value and be glad to own it, and I had left it in that hole, and at any minute he might miss it, possibly ask for it. The day was one of torment. My mother was away or shut up in her room. My father, I don't know just what thoughts I had about him. He was not to be seen either, and the servants cast strange looks at me when I spoke his name but I little realized the blow which had just fallen upon the house in his definite departure, and only thought of my own trouble, and of how I should meet my grandfather's eye when the hour came for him to draw me to his knee for his usual good night. That I was spared this ordeal for the first time this very night first comforted me, then added to my distress. He had discovered his loss and was angry. On the morrow he would ask me for the box, and I would have to lie, for never could I find the courage to tell him where I had been. Such an act of presumption he would never forgive, or so I thought, as I lay and shivered in my little bed. That his coldness, his neglect, sprang from the discovery just made that my mother, as well as my father, had just fled the house forever, was as little known to me as the morning calamity. I had been given my usual tendance and was tucked safely into bed. But the gloom, the silence which presently settled upon the house, had a very different explanation in my mind from the real one. My sin, for such it loomed large in my mind by this time, coloured the whole situation and accounted for every event. At what hour I slipped from my bed on to the cold floor I shall never know. To me it seemed to be in the dead of night, but I doubt if it were more than ten. So slowly creep away the moments to a wakeful child. I had made a great resolve. Awful as the prospect seemed to me, frightened as I was by the very thought, I had determined in my small mind to go down into the cellar and into that midnight hole again in search of the lost box. I would take a candle and matches, this time from my own mantel shelf, and if every one was asleep, as appeared from the deathly quiet of the house, I would be able to go and come without anybody ever being the wiser. Dressing in the dark, I found my matches and my candle, and, putting them in one of my pockets, softly opened my door and looked out. Nobody was stirring. Every light was out except a solitary one in the lower hall. That this still burned conveyed no meaning to my mind. How could I know that the house was so still and the room so dark because every one was out searching for some clue to my mother's flight? If I had looked at the clock, but I did not. I was too intent upon my errand, too filled with the fever of my desperate undertaking, to be affected by anything not bearing directly upon it. Of the terror caused by my own shadow on the wall as I made the turn in the hall below, I have as keen a recollection today as though it happened yesterday. But that did not deter me. Nothing deterred me, till, safe in the cellar, I crouched down behind the casks to get my breath again before entering the hole beyond. I had made some noise in feeling my way around these casks, and I trembled lest these sounds had been heard upstairs. But this fear soon gave place to one far greater. 
other sounds were making themselves heard. A din of small scurrying feet, above, below, on every side of me. Rats! Rats in the wall, rats on the cellar bottom. How I ever stirred from the spot I do not know. But when I did stir, it was to go forward and enter the uncanny hole. I had intended to light my candle when I got inside, but for some reason I went stumbling along in the dark, following the wall till I got to the steps where I had dropped the box. Here a light was necessary, but my hand did not go to my pocket. I thought it better to climb the steps first, and softly one foot found the tread and then another. I had only three more to climb, and then my right hand, now feeling its way along the wall, would be free to strike a match. I climbed the three steps, and was steadying myself against the door for a final plunge when something happened. Something so strange, so unexpected, and so incredible, that I wonder I did not shriek aloud in my terror. The door was moving under my hand. It was slowly opening inward. I could feel the chill made by the widening crack. Moment by moment this chill increased. The gap was growing. A presence was there. A presence before which I sank in a small heap upon the landing. Would it advance? Had it feet? Hands? Was it a presence which could be felt? Whatever it was, it made no attempt to pass, and presently I lifted my head, only to quake anew at the sound of a voice, a human voice, my mother's voice, so near me that by putting out my arms I might have touched her. She was speaking to my father. I knew it from the tone. She was saying words which, little understood as they were, made such a havoc in my youthful mind that I have never forgotten them. I have come, she said. They think I have fled the house and are looking far and wide for me. We shall not be disturbed. Who would think of looking here for either you or me? Here, the words sank like a plummet in my breast. I had known for some few minutes that I was on the threshold of the forbidden room. But they were in it. I can scarcely make you understand the tumult which this awoke in my brain. Somehow I had never thought that any such braving of the house's law would be possible. I heard my father's answer, but it conveyed no meaning to me. I also realized that he spoke from a distance, that he was at one end of the room while we were at the other. I was presently to have this idea confirmed, for while I was striving with all my might and main to subdue my very heart-throbs, so that she would not hear me or suspect my presence, the darkness, I should rather say the blackness of the place, yielded to a flash of lightning, heat-lightning, all glare and no sound, and I caught an instantaneous vision of my father's figure standing with gleaming things about him, which affected me at the moment as supernatural, but which, in later years, I decided to have been weapons hanging on a wall. She saw him, too, for she gave a quick laugh, and said that they would not need any candles. And then there was another flash, and I saw something in his hand, and something in hers, and though I did not yet understand, I felt myself turning deathly sick, and gave a choking gasp, which was lost in the rush she made into the centre of the room, and the keenness of her swift, low cry. Guard toi for only one of us will ever leave this room alive. A duel, a duel to the death between this husband and wife, this father and mother, in this hole of dead tragedies, and within the sight and hearing of their child. Has Satan ever devised a scheme more hideous for ruining the life of an eleven-year-old boy? Not that I took it all in at once. I was too innocent and much too dazed to comprehend such hatred, much less the passions which engendered it. I only knew that something horrible, something beyond the conception of my childish mind, was going to take place in the darkness before me and the terror of it made me speechless. Would to God it had made me deaf and blind and dead! 
she had dashed from her corner and he had slid away from his as the next fantastic gleam which lit up the room showed me it also showed the weapons in their hands and for a moment i felt reassured when i saw these were swords for I had seen them before with foils in their hands, practicing for exercise, as they said, in the great garret. But the swords had buttons on them, and this time the tips were sharp and shone in the keen light. An exclamation from her and a growl of rage from him were followed by movements I could scarcely hear, but which were terrifying from their very quiet. Then the sound of a clash. The swords had crossed. Had the lightning flashed forth then, the end of one of them might have occurred. But the darkness remained undisturbed, and when the glare relit the great room again, they were already far apart. This called out a word from him, the one sentence he spoke. I can never forget it. Rhoda, there is blood on your sleeve. I have wounded you. Shall we call it off and fly, as the poor creatures in there think we have, to the opposite ends of the earth? I almost spoke. I almost added my childish plea to his for them to stop, to remember me and stop. But not a muscle in my throat responded to my agonized effort. Her cold, clear, no, fell before my tongue was loosed, or my heart freed from the ponderous weight crushing it. I have vowed, and I keep my promises, she went on in a tone quite strange to me. What would either's life be worth with the other alive and happy in this world? He made no answer, and those subtle movements, shadows of movements I might almost call them, recommenced. Then there came a sudden cry, shrill and poignant. Had Grandfather been in his room, he would surely have heard it, and the flash coming almost simultaneously with its utterance. I saw what has haunted my sleep from that day to this. My father, pinned against the wall, sword still in hand, and before him my mother, fiercely triumphant, her staring eyes fixed on his, and... Nature could bear no more. The band loosened from my throat, the oppression lifted from my breast long enough for me to give one wild wail, and she turned, saw... Heaven sent its flashes quickly at this moment, and recognizing my childish form, all the horror of her deed, or so I have fondly hoped, rose within her, and she gave a start, and fell full upon the point upturned to receive her. A groan, then a gasping sigh from him, and silence settled upon the room, and upon my heart and so far as I knew, upon the whole created world. That is my story, friends. Do you wonder that I have never been or lived like other men? After a few moments of sympathetic silence, Mr. Van Brooklyn went on to say, I don't think I ever had a moment's doubt that my parents both lay dead on the floor of that great room. When I came to myself, which may have been soon or may not have been for a long while, the lightning had ceased to flash, leaving the darkness stretching like a blank pall between me and that spot in which were concentrated all the terrors of which my imagination was capable. I dared not enter it. I dared not take one step that way. My instinct was to fly and hide my trembling body again in my own bed and associated with this, in fact dominating it and making me old before my time, was another. Never to tell, never to let anyone, least of all my grandfather, know what that forbidden room now contained. I felt, in an irresistible sort of way, that my father's and mother's honor was at stake. Besides, terror held me back. I felt that I should die if I spoke. Childhood has such terrors and such heroisms. Silence often covers in such abysses of thought and feeling which astonish us in later years. There is no suffering like a child's, terrified by a secret it dare not, for some reason, disclose. Events aided me, 
when in desperation to see once more the light and all the things which linked me to life, my little bed, the toys on the window-sill, my squirrel in its cage, I forced myself to retraverse the empty house, expecting at every turn to hear my father's voice, or come upon the image of my mother. Yes, such was the confusion of my mind, though I knew well enough, even then, that they were dead, and that I should never hear the one or see the other. I was so benumbed with the cold in my half-dressed condition that I woke in a fever next morning after a terrible dream which forced from my lips the cry of, Mother! Mother! Only that. I was cautious even in delirium. This delirium and my flushed cheeks and shining eyes led them to be very careful to me. I was told that my mother was away from home. And when, after two days of search, they were quite sure that all efforts to find either her or my father were likely to prove fruitless, that she had gone to Europe, where we would follow her as soon as I was well. This promise, offering as it did a prospect of immediate release from the terrors which were consuming me, had an extraordinary effect upon me. I got up out of my bed saying that I was well now and ready to start on the instant. The doctor, finding my pulse equable and my whole condition wonderfully improved, and attributing it, as was natural, to my hope of soon joining my mother, advised my whim to be humoured and this hope kept active till travel and intercourse with children should give me strength and prepare me for the bitter truth ultimately awaiting me. They listened to him, and in twenty-four hours our preparations were made. We saw the house closed, with what emotions surging in one small breast, I leave you to imagine, and then started on our long tour. For five years we wandered over the continent of Europe, my grandfather finding distraction, as well as myself, in foreign scenes and associations. But return was inevitable. What I suffered on re-entering this house, God and my sleepless pillow alone know. Had any discovery been made in our absence, or would it be made now that renovation and repairs of all kinds were necessary? Time finally answered me. My secret was safe and likely to continue so. And this fact, once settled, life became endurable, if not cheerful. Since then I have spent only two nights out of this house, and they were unavoidable. When my grandfather died, I had the wainscot door cemented in. It was done from this side, and the cement painted to match the wood. No one opened the door, nor have I ever crossed its threshold. Sometimes I think I have been foolish, and sometimes I know that I've been very wise. My reason has stood firm. How do I know that it would have done so if I had subjected myself to the possible discovery that one or both of them might have been saved if I had disclosed instead of concealed my adventure? A pause during which white horror had shone on every face. Then, with a final glance at Violet, he said, What sequel do you see to this story, Miss Strange? I can tell the past. I leave you to picture the future. Rising, she let her eye travel from face to face till it rested on the one awaiting it, when she answered dreamily, If some morning in the news column there should appear an account of the ancient and historic home of the Van Brooklyns having burned to the ground in the night, the whole country would mourn and the city feel defrauded of one of its treasures. But there are five persons who would see in it the sequel which you ask for. When this happened, as it did happen some few weeks later, the astonishing discovery was made that no insurance had been put upon this house. Why was it that after such a loss Mr. Van Brooklyn seemed to renew his youth it was a constant source of comment among his friends. End of the third part of three of Missing, page 13, by Anna Catherine Green.